So first, before we raise up people to serve God, we need to build up qualities. We pay attention to the qualities of our life and also the people who serve God with us, whether they need some help in changing their lives so that they will serve God with the qualities that God wants, uh, God wants them to have. Okay, now when you're ha ready for lunch, please send me a message, okay? Okay, now the first thing for people who serve God, very important is the relationship with God. That the relationship God, with God is most important because serving God is not just of the mind. It's, it comes from the relationship with God. That uh, first is to have the intimate relationship with God. John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in you bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing because we need to be in Jesus all the time. And then He is in us. It's Jesus showing through us. Jesus' life showing through us. Many ministers are burned out because they don't have Jesus' life coming through them. When they pray, they just say, Lord, please help me in my ministry. I'm in trouble and in trouble. And their mind is all tense. It's all under pressure. Oh, they say, Lord, help me, help me. I'm in trouble. I cannot do it. I have no strength. I, I've known pastors who have no strength. And they pray just like this. Oh, give me strength. I, I'm helpless. I cannot do anything. That way, they are tense. And then the mind, the spirit is not open. But when we relax in God, thank you, Lord Jesus, you are helping us. So we pray with a joyful heart. We thank God. We thank God God is blessing me. So we first believe that God is blessing me. And then we spend more time loving God. And I know that when I love you, Lord, you are loving me too. You are happy with me. You are blessing me right now. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. When we pray with a relationship, a strong relationship with God, then there will be more strength. Uh, or if people have problem with this, they can sing praise songs. And then when they sing praise songs, they, uh, for some people, it's, it's easier. Okay, let me... We continue with um, the questions. We have, do the, did, uh, we have done the instruction before, but now we go through the questions so that we understand it. So next point is about build up the unity of the workers and the church uh, and the members. First question, what breaks the unity of the church workers and members? How to build up unity? Um, there are many factors that can affect uh, the unity of uh, the church workers and members. Sometimes when one person is, you know, not, uh, doesn't have good relationship with others or criticize others or is authoritarian, controlling other people and not loving other people when it's not love, when it's controlling, when it's uh, trying to take advantage of people, then it will break the unity. And then the members, if the members don't feel loved, they don't feel, they don't, uh, they don't care, they don't feel being cared for, and also, when the members hurt each other, the members also have the responsibility of building up the unity and love. But if the members don't do that, then you know it, it's not just on the on the uh, the responsibility is not just on the pastors to build up the unity. When the so when the members don't build up the unity, then the church doesn't have unity. There are churches that people just go there for sermon. They go there for worship, and then. After that, they will go home and they don't care about the other people. That's not church. That's because church is a body of Christ caring for each other. So, uh, and any kind of bitterness and unforgiveness will break the unity. Ephesians 4.16 From whom the whole body joined and knit together by every, what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. What should unity of the church bring? How to build up a church in unity? So here, from whom the whole body joined and knit together, when it's the whole body is joined together by every joint supplies, every joint that, uh, that it hold it together, according to an effective working by which 
every part does its share. So every part, like in the body, every part of the body does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of, of itself in love. So the whole body will grow in love. So what should unity of the church bring? The unity of the church will bring growth in love. The church will grow when there is love, when there is joy and peace and care. Uh, then people will grow and, and people will care about other people and they will bring people to come into the church. And how to build up a church in unity? It has to start, first start with the pastor who preaches the importance of unity. That when we, it's not just the pastor doing the church work, it's everyone. When this belongs to us, when everyone contributes its part, when everyone cares about other people, when everyone has a close relationship with God and, and has the strength from God and care for people and, and bring people in, and then the church will be built up. So it has to be from everybody's effort and also in unity, in, in, in the love of Jesus, in the presence of God. And then the next thing about uh, ministry is about Learn from Jesus to obey the Father. Now from these two passages, we find that Jesus totally submit to the Father. John 5, 19, The Son can do nothing of, itself, of Himself, but what He sees the Father do, what, for whatever He does, the Son also does in like manner. So, the Son cannot do anything of Himself. Now, Jesus has the ability to do it, but He doesn't do it of Himself. He does it when He sees the Father does it, then He follows what the Father does. So that is the submission and the unity in the triune God. Likewise, in the whole body of Christ, if we all join in unity and then we all follow the joint direction of the church, that the church will pray together for direction, for guidance from God and then have a direction of the church in a certain period of time and then everyone follow that then there's unity so here the, the Jesus Christ sees the Father does and then he will do and then in John twelve forty nine, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak now even what to say Jesus totally submitted to God that when the Father told him what to say, he would say it. Then some people say, well, then I lose my own you know, person uh, if I totally submit. But when there is unity, there is love, there is care, then there is strength and there is power, there is life. In unity with God, it's not losing ourselves, it's building up ourselves. So the question here, why did Jesus only did and said what the Father told him to, to do? Because he is, uh, you know, he is submissive and he wants to keep the unity. And he knows that with the unity, then the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in unity can uh, affect the whole world. If the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not in unity, if the Father does one thing and Jesus does another thing and the Holy Spirit does another thing, then there is no unity in the triune God. First, there is unity there and we can learn from them. And also when they are in unity, then they would always do one thing together. So that's why he wants to uh, say and do what the Father says and do. Do most Christians workers only say and do what God told them, told him to? How can we only say and do what God told us to? Uh, I, I, I would say many pastors and many Christians don't do and say what God told him to. Very often we do things by ourselves. But if we do things as God told us to do and say things that God told us to say, then the Christian life will be very strong and there will be unity and God is happy with that person. So I hope we all have this habit of waiting on the Lord and listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit inside. If the Holy Spirit guides us to care about a person, we want to care about the person with love and care. That way, then we're following the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit told us not to fight, not to yell at each other, not to argue, then we submit and obey. And actually, when, whenever anyone is arguing, then he's not doing what Jesus is doing because Jesus doesn't argue. And then, build up the unity of the workers and the members. Um, 
Oh, sorry, this one already is done. Okay, now next is handling problems. Handling problems of in a church. How important is forgiveness? Forgiveness very important to build up the relationship with God and also with people. If there is no forgiveness, then there will be problem in the church. And if there is there are people who refuse to forgive, we have to find ways to help them to forgive so that there is unity. And we have to guide them, we counsel them so that they are willing to forgive each other, but not by force. Second Timothy two fourteen, not to strive after about words, to no uh, no profit to the ruin of the hearer. So we should not argue because it's uh, it it will hurt the hearers. What will arguments produce? How to avoid arguments? Arguments will produce uh, the breaking of the unity and people fight against each other and dislike each other and bitterness. How to avoid? We want to listen and respond to people's feelings and their needs. Instead of arguing, we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us how to, how to um, how to solve a certain problem, how to communicate. Matthew 18, 15 to 17, talk about how to handle people's problem. Uh, first, handle problem face to face and one to one. And then if the person doesn't listen, then we handle with one or two other person. And then if not, handle with the whole church. So the question is, what would happen if people don't follow this? How is this helpful to help to handle problems of people? Now, if a church, in a church there is problem, and then other people will gossip about them, or do things against them without facing them, without talking to them face to face, then there will be resentment and hatred, and saying, uh, the pastor doesn't listen to me, the people don't listen to me. I've seen churches break up. When the pastor insists you have to submit and the people are not willing, instead of talking it through, they force, the pastor forces the people to submit. And then what happens is uh, the whole church break up. I've seen two churches break up like that. So um, we want to handle problems face to face and in a gentle way and, and respect each other. That has to come from teaching people to uh, to be gentle and submit to each other and care about the unity of the church, to respect God. Because when people break up the church, God doesn't like it. It breaks God's heart. So how is this helpful to handle problems of people? Um, so, uh, so first talk to one person and then bring one or two person and then finally to, uh, to bring the whole church. Is this helpful? Yes, that's the right way. First face to face. And then, if not, with one or two persons. So it's, uh, I have handled many problems of people. They, usually they refuse to talk to the other person. But I would say, uh, in order to keep the unity of the church, we have to talk to each other and face it together. Okay, handling problems of people. Uh, so if there are people have problems, what can we do? So these are the steps. And then the... And these are the questions. The steps are discern what the issues are by asking questions and listening. So if there are problem, we listen to them and find out what's the issue and, and then we listen to them. Number two, listen and respond to the feelings and needs. So if they have anger, we listen to them. We don't, we don't just say, uh, calm down and, and, uh, and we will continue to talk, but we listen to them. If there's there is some problem that caused some people to be angry. We want to listen to them. What caused you to be angry? And uh, I'm sorry to hear this happen. And, and then if there is someone who hurt the person to have caused him to have anger, the first thing we want to do is to have forgiveness. So someone who caused the other person to be angry has to admit his fault and ask for forgiveness. And then the other person forgives him and then we continue uh, uh, with the conversation. So we'll listen and then respond to the feelings to bring in uh, forgiveness. Number three, invite them to analyze. So what 
are the causes of the problem? Why, why, uh, um, why do we have the problem now? And explore how to solve the problem. So to analyze the problem and resolve the problem by asking questions and not to accuse. So these are ways to resolve people's problem. Please explain these steps. So I just did. So find out the issues and listen and respond to the feelings and needs and instead of just forcing them to forgive, find out what happened and then saying if we want to keep the unity of the church, can we forgive? And if the person says, the other person has done something wrong to you, okay, so everyone has to uh, say sorry about what you've done wrong. And then so both persons say sorry for what you've done wrong. And then can you forgive each other because we're Christians? So listen and respond to the feelings. Uh, maybe they feel ignored. So where, where does that come from? Where does that uh, come from? And then find out. And then uh, if it's true, then the person also will ask for forgiveness and invite them to analyze and explore how to resolve uh, the problem. So what is the source of the problem and how can we uh, resolve it? Uh, and then do you think they're workable? Uh, so uh, for me, it's workable, and I hope you see that it's workable. Uh, the very important is that the leaders are willing to admit the fault and then be willing to discuss, and the members are willing to admit the fault too. So everyone needs to be able to admit the fault and then forgive each other, and then continue to, <coughs> uh, to reconcile for the hope of unity. What are the things we have to pay attention to is never accuse, never make the other person feel bad, and uh, not to um, do things that make the other person feel we uh, we dislike them, uh, we reject them, but be sincere to find the root of the problem. Now, sometimes there are people who are problem makers. The other person try to solve the problem, but this person is a problem maker in the church. Then we need to talk with this person and find out why he's angry, why he does that. And then if we find out that it's all his fault, then we have to ask him, do you realize what you're doing is hurting the church? Are you uh, willing to, you know, do you want the church to, uh, to be healed and then this relationship healed? If a person sins and he doesn't repent of his sins, finally we have to bring in one or two persons to handle and bring in the whole church to handle. And if the person refuses to repent, then he has to be uh, excommunicated. Now I know that some churches have a sinner's bench so they can sit on the sinner's bench and, and, and listen to the sermon. So we want to um, give them a way, a way that they can uh, time for them to overcome the problem. But if people are constant troublemakers, then one day we have to really stop all his rights as a member. Okay, now we come to uh, ministers, marriage, and family. So Ephesians 5.21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Now here, in Ephesians 5, 21 and 22, 22 says that wives submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Now, there are many husbands that force their wives to submit to them because of this verse. But they didn't look at verse 21. It says, submit to one another in the fear of God. So it's not just the wife submitting to her husband. The husband also listened to the needs of the wife and submit to her also. Um, if one person, if the husband just forced the wife to submit, it doesn't work because if you know he doesn't love the wife and he just yells at the wife and then he says the wife has to submit to me and just do everything I want you to do, that's not the biblical submission. The biblical submission is the husband loves the wife and the wife submit to him willingly. And then there is love and submission at the same time. At the same time, the husband also submits to the wife to listen to her opinions and try to work things out. So this is healthy relationship. So does the Bible teach an absolute submission of the wives? Uh, I, according to verse 21, the Bible doesn't teach an absolute submission of the wives. 
Or does it talk about a mutual submission? So the Bible does talk about mutual submission. While well, the wife should pay more attention to submit. Now, why do wives pay attention to submission? We can see that Paul told the husband to love your wife and told the wives to submit to your husband. The fact is, men usually are hard to love. It's difficult for them to love. It's uh, easier for them to do their own things. And wives generally, they care about the family, care about the husband and the family more. And so the tendency for the wife is they're too responsible. So they want to take over everything and they're unhappy about things and then they will nag. And so they need to learn to submit because generally the biggest problem is not love. It's the biggest problem is submission. And then for the husband, the biggest problem is, is love. So the Bible tells us to do that, but it doesn't mean that only person love and one only one person submit. Both person love, both person submit. I have known a minister who insists that uh, the wife only submit to him, and he doesn't listen. And when I communicate with him, I found that he doesn't listen to me. He doesn't listen to anyone. When he talks, he just keeps talking, always talking about his own thing, never listen. And uh, what happened is, uh, soon after marriage, he went through a divorce. And I told him that's not from the Bible. He said, well, I felt very peaceful. Uh, the Lord guided me to divorce. I don't believe that. I, you know, I don't think God guided us to divorce. I think God guided us to handle the problem, but He refused uh, to have, you know, for me to counsel them. He just said, God gave me great peace uh, to divorce. Another man, I counseled him with an, uh, uh, a woman that he was dating, and then I found that, you know, he doesn't listen and care about the, the girlfriend at that time. So I suggest to him that you need to learn to uh, listen and respond uh, to your girlfriend. But he said, this is not my way. He said, this is your way, but it's not my way. But the Bible does say, be swift to listen. We want to listen, but he doesn't listen. And then later he split up with this girlfriend. And then he married another woman. But also soon after marriage, the marriage also break up. Because when he doesn't listen, then... It's very hard to keep the marriage. So I hope that we all realize that it's both have to love and both have to submit and both have to listen. Okay, now Ephesians 5.25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Why is it hard for most husbands to love their wives? How can we develop this love? It's hard for most husbands to love their wives because most Husband, males generally pay attention to doing things. Like if they are devoted to the work, they really work hard. They're devoted to church, they really work hard, but they forget about the relationship. So we want, uh, husbands want to learn to love, want to love to, want to learn to care. Okay, so these are the questions. Uh, is it important to give time to the spouse and children? Is it a waste of time? Uh, it's important because first we want to build up the family before we can serve God. It's not a waste of time because in the process, first to build up the family in love. Next, the husband will learn to listen, learn to build a relationship, and then he can minister to people better. It's not a waste of time to spend time with the wife and the children. Second, Female treasure relationship more than male. When a husband loves his wife, she will be more peaceful and supportive of the husband. If not, she will be more emotional. How should we apply this to our marriage? Now, generally, women are more, they pay attention to relationship more, even little girls. Uh, I was a pastor in a church years ago. I mean, I've, I've been always been a pastor, but in that church, uh, when people come out, the pastors greet everyone so I had that uh, I did that all this time I noticed that little girls when they come out with the parents they always excited to see the pastors and they will respond and they shake their hand and they're happy but when the little boys came out 
they're holding their little car, the little toy, and they're looking at the little toy. They don't look at the pastors. They're not as interested in people as girls are. So female, when they grow up, they treasure relationship more than males. And then, so when a, a husband loves the wife, she will be more peaceful and supportive of the husband. If not, she will be more emotional. She has a lot of frustration inside that need to come out. So the husband need to learn to respond to her and care about her, and then the marriage will go better. So how should we apply this to the marriage, that the husband should learn to love and listen to the wife and spend time with the wife and the children? Are you willing to love your spouse, to give time, listen, respond, say sorry, treasure, resolve problems? So are you willing to do that, to love your spouse, give time to them, listen and respond, and say sorry for anything we've done wrong and treasure them, they are precious and resolve any problem. So these are all very important. These are all very important. Number four, uh, what do you think of the custom of men eating together, women and children eating separately? Uh, when I came to Africa, I noticed this. I hope you don't mind. I noticed that the men will eat together and then the wife and the children eat in the kitchen. And I asked them, is that how you eat at home? They say, yes, this is how we normally eat. Uh, that, you know, if there are two men in the house and then the two men will eat in the dining room. And then the children and the women will eat in the kitchen. Uh, I want you to think about where this came from. I think this came from maybe ancient African culture. That because they... Uh, in that culture, the, uh, the women are lower, so the women, they don't eat with the men. They have to eat in the kitchen, and the children, too, are lower. So the men are the heroes, so they eat in the dining room. But as we become Christians, I think we should not follow this old custom. We should say, husband and wife and children should eat together to build up the relationship and the communication to care about each other. Now, even when there are guests coming to the house, eat together so that the wife and the, and the children can participate. When I go to see some people that I, I like my wife to uh, participate, I will ask her along. When I you know, go to a new church to serve, I like the wife to also meet the, hus the, the pastor and talk with the pastor together too. Because then she will be part of it and she will give me opinions ideas. So I hope, I hope you think about it. You can respond with the WhatsApp and tell me what you think about it. I think this is not a healthy way. This would make the marriage harder. Okay, and then uh, this minister's attitude toward ministry. This is what we talk about first when we started today. So Psalm 139, it talks about all the days of my life have been written in your book before one of them came to be. So God has a plan in our lives. So the question is, does God have a plan for Christians and for the churches? How does this affect our attitude toward ministry? So you think about that. So does God have a plan for churches? Yes, He does, because church is made of people. So God has a plan for each person. So God has the plan for each person. So this church, where they go to, also God has a plan. So how does it affect our attitude toward ministry? That God has a plan already. God wants to do something great there. It's God's church, God's ministry. So we want to submit to God to let the church grow strong. So this is God's ministry. He'll care about it. So that's very important attitude. It's God's ministry. He care about it more than we do. So we don't have to worry. We don't have to beg God to have mercy on the church. Rather, we open our hearts so that God will work in the lives that He is the Lord of the church and of our lives. You know, many people will pray, Lord, give us revival, revival. Now, this is wrong, not wrong to pray, but don't pray like this every day. Instead, we'll say, Lord, I'm here. Please tell me what I've done wrong. Please tell me how I can serve you better. Please help me, tell me how I can help the church to grow. Guide me to understand your way. 
Because when we open a way to God, then God can work in the church and then God can make the church grow. God always wants to make the church grow. God always wants to bring revival to churches. It's just people we don't cooperate. So I hope that we realize the problem is not in God, it's in us. It's not that God is not willing to bring a revival. It's whether people are open to let God bring the revival in their lives first and then to the church. Okay, so how does God, God's presence help our ministry? That's very important that the presence of God, when people come to church and praise God and love God and, and preach the word of God so that people understand God's love and then care about each other, then God's presence is with the church all the time. In many places, the church has a stronger presence of God. So God's presence is very important. But at the same time, there are churches that are very dead. No life, no care, no presence of God. It's people, they don't really love God. So we, we really need God's presence uh, with us more praying. Okay, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Moreover, it's required in stewards that one should be found faithful. So as stewards, we want to be faithful. And then when we're faithful, then we have uh, fulfilled our responsibilities, although we can improve. When we are working hard and are faithful, do we have to feel guilty if our ministry does not grow big? Now, sometimes pastors say, oh, my church hasn't grown much. I feel very guilty. We, we don't have to feel guilty. We can say, well, I'm so, I'm so thankful. Uh, I can, you know, God has moved me to love Him and to serve Him. And I have worked hard. I've been faithful and God is happy with me. And I'm happy, I'm happy with myself. There is room for growth. And Lord, please guide me. And, but I've done my best here now. So I'm faithful. I don't have to feel guilty. And if there is someone accuses us, we'll tell them, I try my best. You can tell me how I can try better. You can tell me. But I've been faithful so I can be peaceful. I don't have to be accused. If you have any suggestion, tell me. I will work on it. So as pastors, we want to say, yes, I'll work on it when you give me suggestions. And then uh, this attitude that uh, not to fear the devil, not to fear the devil. Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So how can at Satan attack us? Do we have to fear Satan? Satan attack Christians and the church when the people in the church don't trust in God, they don't have a good relationship with God, and when people sin. When we sin, when we fight, when we argue, when we hurt each other, then Satan can attack us. So we realize that the attack would not come if not for our problems with God and our problems with people and our sins. So we realize that if we have a close relationship with God and submit to God and love God and serve God wholeheartedly, Satan cannot attack. Satan will try to do things. But when we trust in God every day, God will guide us how to overcome the power of Satan. So we don't have to fear Satan. And some people say, oh God, uh, the sa Satan is attacking me today. I get sick. It's Satan attacks. Many people blame Satan for everything. Actually, they should blame themselves for what they've done wrong. Do we have to fear Satan? No, we don't have to fear Satan. But we have to realize that Satan can be very powerful if we sin. He will, he will come on to us. So we want to not to sin. Okay, and then number five, that my word, Isaiah 55, 11, says that my word, will, uh, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I send it. So the the Word of God is powerful, it will not come back void, it will accomplish what God pleases and it will prosper in the things uh, it's sent for. So what does this verse tell us about the power of God's Word? God's Word is very, very powerful. It will accomplish what God wants uh, the Word of God to do. But some people say, how come I preach the Word of God and they don't believe? Well, if they don't believe, then the Word of God will bring judgment on them or one day can change them to, to Jesus. But still the Word of God is powerful. So we don't want to say the Word of God is not powerful. If we really live out the Word of God and really fill with the joy of the Lord and fill with the 
uh, conviction of the Word of God, then our life will show uh, the life of God. And then people will be changed by the Word of God. How can we have a stronger power when teaching the Word of God? The key is to have a close relationship with God. And when we read the Bible, always believe it when we read it. So it, it will say, the Word of God shall not return to God void. The Word of God will accomplish. So internalize the Bible verses. The Word of God will accomplish God's will. He will it will accomplish and will prosper in the things that it was sent for. So God's Word is powerful. I, I can believe in God's Word. It will do wonderful things. When I can preach God's Word with confidence, then it will do great things. So we need to build up the confidence and have a close relationship with God and apply the Word of God. It's very important that we live out the Word of God. We trust in God. We relax in Him. We enjoy Him so that every word we teach is from our life. I thank God now that uh, now at this time when I preach, it all came from my experience that I can see that God's Word is very powerful. And then this Bible verse we talked about earlier, 1 Corinthians 3, 8 to 13, about that our work will be tested. It will be, uh, if we are building with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, straw, uh, hay, and straw, what would this verse remind us to pay attention to? So what do we pay attention to? What motivation can we have toward our ministry? So we want to pay attention to the quality of our good work, the motivation. So this make up the quality, the motivation. Why do we serve God? Do we serve God to compete or, or to get money or to, uh, uh, just to fulfill a responsibility? Or do we serve God because God's love and because of our care for people, because God's word is wonderful. God is wonderful. So I'm happy to serve God. Then it's gold, silver, and precious stones. And then so we, uh, uh, so we want to pay attention to the quality of our life and our ministry. And uh, so what motivation can we have from this verse? The motivation is if I have a pure quality, if I do it to please God and to bless people, God is very happy and God will bless me and, and remember my good works and God will bless my whole life. Okay, and then handling failure. It's uh, even though when we are hard pressed on every side, there are pressure from every side that we can have victory. So how can we face difficulties and failure? Uh, for instance, if someone attacks you, accuse you, what can we do? We need to keep applying God's word using the five steps to vic of victory. First, I realize I'm affected by someone's word. Second, it's destructive that I'm affected by him. Third, what does the Bible say? Not to be affected by people. This God is for me. Who is against me? I'm not afraid. Who can be against me? Number four, pray for forgiveness and strength. Number five, choose to obey. I choose to obey God. So I, I choose not to be affected by Him. There have been people who accuse me from time to time, say negative words from time to time. There are people just too busy to accuse. And, uh, and then I will say, okay, did I do anything wrong? If I didn't do anything wrong, I don't have to feel sad about that, feel bad about that. If I've done something wrong, I would uh, apologize. If I haven't done anything wrong, I will, you know, I will put it down. I will say, I don't have to be affected by the person. I can accept the person and I ask God for wisdom to handle that person, how to handle his problem. Some people are hard to handle because of the stubbornness, but I'll ask God for wisdom. Whether this person, sometimes some people, we can handle it, but some people, they are um, uh, they're stubborn, they don't want to change. Then for some people like that, if we handle it with a few people already, they don't listen. Then we don't have to be affected by by the person and if he's in a church we can ex excommunicate the person if he's outside the church we don't have to uh, you know we don't have to spend time with the person we don't have to listen to the person but we still want to bless the person so when there is pressure we say 
I'm blessed by God. I follow God. I don't have to be angry. I don't want to hate the person. I want to bless the person. I want to forgive the person and pray for blessing. And I want to treat the person nicely. That is overcoming difficulty. So uh, for many people, when they have difficulty, they'll say, Oh, I want to give up. Oh, I'm very sad. I have no strength. So that's not what we want to do. We want to say, I'm full of the strength of the Lord. God is happy with me if I try to be nice to the person and I'm, I'm not affected by the other person. So these are things we can do. Now, if you have questions like how to handle pressure, negative things, like the church is not growing, what can we do? Then we have the whole church face it together. Let's pray together for strength and give us wisdom, how to handle the problem in the church, how to grow and how to help the people grow spiritually so that we can affect the other people. And then when newcomers come, we welcome them together and we work together to bring people to the church. And then we encourage the people in the church. Everyone is encouraged then they will stay in the church and they will participate in the church. So I hope that we'll, when we face difficulties and persecution or pressure, we'll work on it with God's help, okay? And uh, so the next session will be another, another session. If, is there any question now? Is there any question? If there's any question, uh, if there's no question, I'll pray first. And then if you have question, you can type it there. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you Lord Jesus, because you are Almighty God. Oh Lord Jesus, help us in the ministry. Help us to have a close relationship with you. Help us to have strength from you every day, every moment. Help us to take care of our own problems so that we're not affected by people. Help us to listen to people, to respond to people, to help people, and to give us motivation to serve you. And knowing that you are really happy when we serve you wholeheartedly. You are very happy when we want to bless people, want to help people, when we have compassion of people, you're very, very happy. So we can be all joyful in the Lord. When we do anything, small thing, even give a cup of cold water, you're very happy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You, you are happy with every good thing we do. So we have the motivation to love you all the time and love people and to serve you with motivation. And when we serve you with motivation, with love and care, then we are building up silver, gold, and precious stone. And you remember all our good works and you bless us. Thank you, Lord. Give us motivation. And if we have problems in the church, please give us wisdom to handle it. Lord, I know that sometimes churches have problems. Please help us to have the wisdom to handle it with care, with, with forgiveness, with acceptance, and not with fighting or accusation, but with Forgiveness and, and acceptance is not an easy thing. Lord, help us. In Jesus' name we pray.